But it's a revolution that's a special revolution. It's a nonviolent intellectual revolution. It's yeah. not a brand new idea because it's more or less just a continuation of those ideas that made America great and for some yeah. reason, unfortunately, they forgot about a hundred years ago and we need to revive that spirit of liberty once again in this country. definitely changed recently, especially in the last four or five years, in the last ten years. I've been more or less talking about some of these issues for 30 years and I notice a big difference, but it's dramatically different in the last five years because the American people have awakened and found out that we do not have a sound economic policy. And so many now realize that we don't have sound money and we need to do something about our Federal Reserve System. Sounds like a wonderful idea. <laughs> Where did you ever get that idea? <laughs> now, the monetary system is very vital. If you want to uh, really understand the cause of liberty, the purpose of liberty, and sound economic policy, you have to deal with monetary policy. But also, something else has happened in the last uh, four to five years. There's been several of us in Washington trying to fight and thwart off the wars that we've gotten involved in and, and have a different type of foreign policy. Not a foreign policy of aggression, not a foreign policy of violence, but a foreign policy that is designed with friendship and trade to all nations willing to trade and be friends of this country. people in Washington that don't not quite understand that uh, we uh, are less respected and less liked when we invade countries, bomb countries, occupy countries, tell other people what to do, bribe their dictators. So there's another option and uh, the American people are hearing about it and they're understanding it and that is why now 75% of the American people have come to our viewpoint and said it's time to come home, get out of Afghanistan, bring the trip home. So there is a, a definite different attitude with economic policy, the Federal Reserve, and uh, also the foreign policy. But there's also an awakening in this country that there has been a systematic attack on our civil liberties and we have to stand up and say no more. The purpose of government is to protect our liberty, not to destroy our liberty. The founders were very proud of the Fourth Amendment. Uh, they wanted privacy. They didn't want the king and the military coming into their homes uh, without permission and without warrants. And yet today, we're living under a law that says that the Fourth Amendment has very little meaning and the president and the executive branch can do just about whatever they want. This is the reason I have talked about before it was passed and since it's been passed, and I believe it should be one of the first things that we repeal once in office, and that is getting rid of the Patriot Act. American people are waking up, whether it has this attack on our personal civil liberties, whether it's our attack on our First Amendment rights, whether it's the understanding of economics, which is uh, coming around to making more sense, as well as the foreign policy. And this is what uh, is dramatically different, and it's dramatically different on the campuses of this country. We're getting thousands of people coming out, I, and if you look for the information about what is happening, guess what? The revolution is not being described on TV. <laughs> yeah. But, the good side of it, we have the internet. Yeah. And the scary part of it is that they know it and they're trying to take the internet away from us and we're not going to let them take yeah. the internet away. They 
want to use the internet to control and understand. They just recently built a huge, the biggest thing in the history of the world, and that is a national security agency uh, compound out in Utah that is can hold more records than any one establishment before. Trillions and trillions of dollars of, of, of items on all individuals in this country. They don't need that kind of information. They're supposed to do the opposite. They're, we're supposed to have openness in government and privacy for the people, not attacking the privacy of the people. Four years ago, five years ago, there were quite a few, mostly the e economists that were in the Austrian economic camp, were, were very much aware of the financial bubble and warned about it, and sure enough, it came. Well, the financial bubble comes from the ability of the Fed to monetize debt, which is an encouragement, it's a facilitator, it's a taxer, because if governments can spend endlessly for the benefit of buying votes for, them, for the individual to stay in office, and they never have to worry about paying the bills in the near term, you can tax for a while, you, there's a limit you can tax, and you can borrow for a while, and then interest rates go up, but then you have this facilitator, this, uh, this instrument of creating new money. Money. And then we had this benefit of us issuing the reserve currency of the world. I trust it because the dollar used to be as good as gold. But the strange thing happened when the gold was removed in 1971, there still remained a fair amount of trust. Now they're still under the illusion in Washington that the trust will remain forever. But guess what? The trust isn't there anymore and it's rapidly disappearing. And this is why this recession is different. And it's worldwide. There's a crisis in Europe. They admit now they're going back into recession. And of course, we haven't solved our problems because we're all facing the same problem. Government has gotten too big, they fight too many wars, they undermine liberties, write too many regulations, and manipulate the economy too much. So the predictable crisis come, and guess what they do in Washington? Congress, the executive branch, the, the uh, Federal Reserve, they say, oh, we're in trouble now, so what we need to do is spend more money, borrow more money, have more regulations, and let the Fed print money endlessly. How can you solve the problem? You cannot solve the problem of too much spending and too big a government by spending more and making the government bigger. You have to do the opposite. going to be an important year. It'll be the anniversary of something that happened in uh, 1913 and uh, that will be the appropriate year on the 100th anniversary of the Federal Reserve where we'll repeal the Federal Reserve Act. to come around to really understanding what personal liberty is all about, they will realize what Jefferson talked about, that we have a God-given right to our life and our liberty, and we ought to have a God-given right to keep the fruits of our labor as well. Which means the 16th Amendment needs repeal just as well. people to work and keep what they earn, believe me, they will work harder. Today, productive energy is not released in this country. If somebody really wants to get productive, how many jobs are going overseas? There's a lot of U.S. companies right now that are adding jobs, but when you look at it, the jobs are being added overseas. So there is so much we can do here to encourage individuals to come back. The tragedy here in this country is if you're on the if you're on the uh, receiving end, if you if you know the inside track, you get the benefits as the bubble is being blown up, and then when the crunch comes, guess what? They get bailed out. We need to stop all the bailouts. They don't deserve the bailout. has come about mainly because of a misunderstanding of the entitlement system. The entitlement sounds like an entitlement is a right, but an entitlement isn't a right. You have a right to your life. 
You have a right to ownership of your life. You have a right to your liberty. You should have the right to the fruits of your labor. But entitlement means that you're entitled to somebody else's life or somebody else's productive effort, somebody else's wealth. No, you don't have that. But it's always well intended. They say, well, this is only for the poor people, the people falling through the cracks, and they're entitled to own a house. And, uh, of course, that led to the housing bubble. And they're entitled to free food and free education on down. But there is no such thing as free stuff. You have to right. take it from somebody. So it reminds me of my little bumper sticker in Washington, D.C. It says, simply, don't steal. The government hates competition. Yeah. Woo! Yeah. But the entitlement system, although it is, has been designed, and many people believe, and, and they're very sincere, <laughs> and they say, we do care about our fellow man, and we want to make sure that nobody's poor, and we're going to take care of it. But guess what? The entitlement system takes care of the wealthy. It's the Goldman Sachs of the world, it's the banking system, the military industrial complex, the whole mess. They feel entitled and they throw the crumbs to the poor and then when there's a crisis, the rich get bailed out and the poor get poorer, the middle class loses their job and they end up losing their houses as well. So this is the reason why we have to challenge the whole notion of the entitlement system. You're entitled to your freedoms and the government should be protecting your liberties, not pretending it can redistribute wealth and create wealth by doing it. It destroys wealth under those conditions. So very simply, in order to restore a sound economy and get jobs back here again, I think we should cut spending. But that's, that's such a strange idea in Washington. Even our side of the aisle has a proposal to look like they're cutting spending, but they're only cutting proposed increases. In the next 10 years, the proposed increases are about $10 trillion. So if they cut them down to 9 or $8 trillion, they say, oh, look, we just cut $2 trillion. I want to cut it. I want to cut a trillion dollars of real money in the first year. about it and they say, oh, won't that cause a crash in the economy and this will really wreck things, you can't do that. But what about, what about saving all this money on the wars? Wouldn't that be a good place to start? Yeah. In the last 10 years, there was $4 trillion added to our debt by fighting these wars overseas. Now, the founders had a good way of restraining us from getting involved in war. They simply wrote in the Constitution that only Congress can declare the war, and which means the Congress is the closest to the people, so the people have a say through their congressmen whether or not we will make this precise de de declaration of going to war. Since World War II, we haven't done it. Since World War II, we haven't won a war. Since World War II, we've spent trillions of dollars and loss of hundreds of thousands of lives and hundreds of thousands of people injured and just think of the tragedy of of the injured that's coming back from uh, Iraq and Afghanistan now uh, if you look at what kind of lives that we have lost in the last 10 years since 9-11 Americans we've uh, soldiers and con contractors we've lost 8,500 that's not a fair deal I understand 9-11 very very well but going into a policy where we spend a lot of money, bankrupt ourselves, and a lot of Americans get killed, that's not very good payback. We need to wise up and have a different type of foreign policy. So declaring war on the world by a global war on terrorism, terrorism is a monstrous thing to deal with, but by by marching around the world believing that we have the moral authority to bomb any country, any place because there might be a terrorist hiding behind a bush and having secret weapons and having drone missiles directed from individuals in the United States and going over. And guess what? We make mistakes. I mean, do we know that we kill the right people? No. We know that a lot of children and a lot of innocent people die and we know that every time you kill one over there under those circumstances, you probably create another hundred who's saying, why are we being terrorized by bombs falling out of the sky? We haven't done anything.
reason in the world why we can cut a lot of money out of the military. If we can have priorities. If we continue to do what we're doing, we're going to bring in the destruction of the currency and even the social security recipients and the elderly getting medical care and the children's health care and education program, they will come crashing down because when the money doesn't work, nothing works. So we could work our way out of it, but we can't do it by spending more money and printing more money. It won't work, and I think the American people know it, that it can't work. So my idea of cutting a trillion dollars sends a message that we're going to get our house in order. Uh, we can start with overseas spending. We, we don't need to give away foreign aid. I'm, I'm convinced that foreign aid is taking money from poor people in this country and giving it to rich people in poor countries. up to be a political football and it doesn't help the people it's supposed to help over there it helps uh, helps the government and uh, besides if we're a very wealthy country and doing well and setting an example we as individuals can decide where to send our money and help the people truly in need of this recession, the American people have been very generous. There's still crises around the world and the American people come. It's so much better than depending on government bureaucrats and special interests uh, doing these kind of things. So that we, we can make these cuts. If we do this, the other suggestion I have is going back to the 06 budget. And the government wasn't too small in, in 2006. It was still rather big, so it's not like we're under, destroying the whole government. We're just going back to a more modest time and getting rid of a few departments, like, say, five of them to begin with. <laughs> We need the Department of Energy passing out ethanol benefits to anybody. So there's a lot of things that we could do to uh, to spend a lot a lot less uh, less less money. And if we did that, we don't have to start. And I think politically, uh, it's a mistake to start on child health care or food for poor people or the elderly health care. Now those programs theoretically shouldn't have started and they're not working. If we continue to do this, they're all going to come crashing down. But if we want to work our way out of it, we have to say where we're going to cut and we should get the people right, left, center, independence to agree that coming home and stop spending this money overseas during these wars would be the easiest place. Cut these others and try to preserve these programs and let people get weaned off. For instance, I think it would be just great if we did this and offered everybody that's coming out of college right now and having a tough time, if you wanted to assume responsibility for yourself to stay out of the social security system and keep your own money and take care of yourself. rather clear about the found uh, about the foreign policy their their strong suggestion was that uh, we we have friendship and trade with as many countries as possible any any that are willing now so often I will be charged and you will as well and say oh you're a bunch of isolationists you don't want to deal with the world oh yeah we want to trade with the world we want to travel we want to go back and forth we want to engage and the individuals who have the sharpest criticism and call us isolationists are the ones who are the very first ones to put on sanctions on countries trying to start another war. And they're the very same people who won't even entertain the thought that it's time to start talking to the Cubans and travel to Cuba and invest in no more sanctions on Cuba. I think when big, rich countries like ours that have all the military might more than all the other countries get together and we intimidate small little countries, third world countries with sanctions and threats. I think it's a sign of insecurity. We shouldn't be insecure. We have so much strength. But we going to ha we will become insecure if we continue to do this because our economy will not sustain us. 
big governments and, and, and empires in countries that overextend overseas are, are usually never defeated militarily. And we're not going to be defeated militarily. We have the military might. But just think, in our lifetime, I mean, the, the, the Soviets didn't have to be defeated. When I was in the Air Force in the 60s, believe me, it was a pretty hot, cold war at the time. And we had the missile crisis in Cuba and these other, other things. But this, the way the Soviets were defeated, they defeated themselves and they were defeated for economic reason. They collapsed upon themselves. And that is what's happening to this country. The biggest threat is here at home. It's not foreign. It's domestic. But ultimately, the real test is looking at our individual lives and what the government, how the government is controlling us as individuals and what is our personal liberties all about. And this is where I think we're slipping so rapidly away from what was intended. And so many people have been willing to say, well, I, I, know, uh, I know I have to give up some of my freedoms to be safe. And I'd like to suggest... I'd like to suggest you never have to and never should give up any of your liberties for safety and security. But this certainly came up after 9-11 and the rapid passage of, of the uh, Patriot Act. Uh, the uh, congressman I was sitting next to when we were voting on the Patriot Act, uh, he, he was voting for it and we only had it, had it on the floor about an hour or so. The bill had been around for a long time in, in one form or another, years, but they couldn't get the consensus to, be, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to pass it. So after 9-11, the consensus was there, oh, we have to do something, we have to do something. I said, why are you voting for this? You don't even know what's in it. He says, I know. I said, you know, there's going to be some bad stuff in this. He says, yeah, I know that. I said, why are you going to vote for it? He says, well, he says, how am I going to go home and explain to my constituents that I voted against the Patriot Act right after 9-11? I said, why don't you, I said, that is what your job is. Go vote right and go home and explain it to them what you're supposed to be doing. <laughs> But instead, we have continued the process. Not only has it been the Patriot Act, we have the, um, the part of the National Defense Authorization Act, where, where the military now is authorized to arrest American citizens held in secret without an attorney and indefinitely. So let's put that high on the list for repeal as well. Healing mood, uh, we'll repeal that Obamacare as well. Yeah. And if we repeal government care, what we have to do is get the government out of the way and allowing you to make your own decisions about your medical care. That is, get the government and the drug companies out of your way for picking alternative health care and nutritional products and vitamins. advance the cause of liberty to such an extreme that we want to return to the times when we were allowed to drink raw milk if we wanted to. Yeah. And, and if a person, if an individual happens to be ill and have heard that growing certain substances in their backyard can help them, <laughs> let them do it. Yeah.